episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Everybody again to another episode of our show with another truly fascinating guest uh, who is helping to create a better tomorrow for all of us. Uh, we have the honor today of being joined by Father James Martin, uh, who is a Jesuit priest, writer, and editor-of-large of the magazine America, which is the national weekly magazine published by the Jesuits of the United States. He also serves as consultant to the Vatican Secretariat for Communications, appointed so by Pope Francis in 2017. Uh, Father Martin is also a New York Times bestselling author whose works include uh, The Jesuit Guide to Almost Everything, A Spirituality for Real Life, uh, Jesus, A Pilgrimage, uh, My Life with the Saints, Building a Bridge, How the Catholic Church and the LGBT Community Can Enter a Relationship with Respect, Compassion, Sensitivity, Activity, and the recently released Learning to Pray, a guide for everyone, which we'll be diving into today. Uh, Father Martin is a frequent commentator on life and the teachings of Jesus, uh, on Ignatian spirituality inspired by the life and teachings of St. Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuit order. Uh, when he's not doing all of that, Father Martin is also an accomplished uh, in the world of theater and film. Uh, he graduated from University of Pennsylvania uh, here in Philadelphia from the Wharton School uh, of Business, later attended the Weston Jesuit School of Theology in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where he received his master's degree in divinity and theology and was ordained a Catholic priest in June of 1999. Uh, Father Martin, thank you for taking the time out of your schedule. Come on the show today. My pleasure and good to be with someone from Philadelphia, the greatest city in the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. Get someone else feels that way. <laughs> so, um, you know, once again, thank you. Yeah, as I mentioned, you know, I'm sitting here in downtown Philadelphia. Uh, you grew up the road, uh, you know, down the road in Plymouth Meeting, mm -hmm. went to uh, to the Wharton School here. I uh, had a, you know, a quite a busy 1980s in the world of corporate finance and human resources. Uh, but then you had a very busy 1990s uh, working in hospice care in Jamaica and the street gangs in Chicago and refugees in Kenya starting small businesses. Uh, take us a little bit on sort of the 1980s, 1990s journey, if you would, for a couple minutes uh, as you entered the the Jesuit order. Yeah, so uh, very happy to be a, a Philly boy. And as you said, I went to the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School of Business. I got a undergraduate degree in uh, finance. They used to say finance, not finance. If you say finance, you get $10,000 more. It sounds more sophisticated. And I worked for uh, GE, formerly great company, now kind of fallen on hard times. In, uh, in New York City, and then in uh, uh, Connecticut, uh, GE Capital, both huge um, uh, financial services arm of GE. And basically, um, I don't know, I, I sort of stepped on that treadmill and uh, studied at Wharton and did well and uh, got a good job at GE. And there was really no one to ever say to me, and certainly no one at Wharton said this to me, what do you really want to do? What are you made for? You know, what, what, are, you, what are you meant to do? And so I eventually, uh, I mean, at the beginning, I really enjoyed my, my time uh, working at GE. It was very exciting. It was the 80s. I was a yuppie. I was making a lot of money and, you know, a lot of nice suits and going out clubbing and blah, 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 and fill in the blanks. And eventually I started to think, gosh, I feel like I'm in the wrong place because I looked around me and noticed that most of my friends, you know, they love to read the Wall Street Journal. They loved reading Fortune and Forbes. And I thought, boy, this is really dull stuff. And I started to think I'm kind of a square peg in a round hole. And I stumbled on the writings of Thomas Merton, the Trampist monk. And uh, that got me thinking about doing something different. And I, I left GE and entered the Jesuits. Uh, and that was just because someone mentioned that the Jesuits were near us in Connecticut at Fairfield University. So it was just kind of by happenstance. And uh, yeah, my, my friends from Wharton, and uh, they, were, they were pretty horrified. And uh, they thought I was joining a cult. And they thought I was nuts and, you know, maybe I was a little nuts, but it was a, it was a great decision, but it was basically, I felt like I was in the wrong place and, and I was pushed out of war, uh, out of GE and I kind of was pulled into the Jesuits and that's where I've been ever since. Outstanding. Um, in, in the new book, Learning to Pray, A Guide for Everyone, um, you, you talk uh, in, in, I believe, chapter five, sort of the basic question, what is prayer? And, and you talk about a lot of terms that uh, we typically hear uh, that, that can get confusing for some of us, whether that's prayer, meditation, contemplation, devotion, and so forth. Uh, and then you go into several definitions that uh, are more appealing uh, to you. Uh, one that um, uh, mentions uh, a conscious conversation with God. Uh, but one where uh, a person is not just reaching out uh, for that conversation, but one where uh, the person is listening uh, in this 
sort of bi-directional conversation with a God or a creator, higher power. Talk a little bit about this definition, if you would. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so that's the definition I come up with by the end after looking at all the other definitions. It, it, it's conscious, meaning it's, it's intentional. So a lot of people say, well, you know, you're in, you're in touch with God the whole day, which is true, you know, all the things you go through, but it's not as conscious. And it's a conversation because, as you say, it's a, it's a two-way street. It's not just talking at God or asking God for things, which is fine. I mean, I certainly I ask for God for, the, for things all the time. It's listening. Now, what does that mean? That's where people say, you know, what are you talking about? That's listening in your daily life, noticing where God is present, so that kind of listening. And listening in your prayer. And what does that mean? It means paying attention to the things that happen in your prayer, emotions, insights, desires, memories, feelings that come up that I'm really, I try to be really blunt about in the book because I think there's too much kind of vague talk when people talk about prayer. It's like, oh, you feel close to God or, oh, God speaks to you or, oh, God. And people say, you know, when I entered the Jesuits, I thought, you know, what are you talking about? Like, what, what's supposed to happen? So for me, one of the most important chapters in the book is, you know, what happens when you close your eyes? Like, what, what's, what happens during prayer? So those kinds of listening. So, but it is, as you say, it is, it is a two-way street. And, and, a, and a couple other interesting points that you make, and in thinking back, uh, obviously my own life, you make uh, a point that one, uh, children uh, are more open or seem more open to engaging in this conversation. They're, they, they don't get embarrassed as easily. Their mind hasn't been jaded by their peers. I don't know, what are you doing? Praying. Um, at yeah. the same time, um, many of us, uh, you actually sort of, feel sort of frozen sort of temporarily uh, in, in regard to some of these rote prayers. You know, I mentioned before the call, you know, I, was, I was bar mitzvahed across the street here and I was taught, you know, I say the Shema twice a day and I, mm -hmm. I shout to Israel and mm, I've been doing that for the last 50 some odd years. It, 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 it's kind of the same prayer. You mentioned some similar prayers in, in, in Catholicism. Talk a little bit about sort of um, yeah, how we sometimes feel stuck, let's say, in, in sort of one model of prayer in our lives. Yeah, now, it's, it's very sort of natural, no matter what the tradition is, right? Um, it, now, it's, it's a kind of both end. So it's not either you pray the prayers that you learned when you were a kid or you pray these, you know, so-called new prayers or, you know, new ways of praying. It's, you know, sometimes you need to rely on those prayers that you know, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, like the Shema or the Our Father or the Hail Mary. But if that's all that it is, then you can feel stuck. And I, I use the example of, um, uh, you know, like the, the, the stuff you learn in elementary school, right, is, is important, right? You need to learn how to add, right, or how to write a sentence and how to do your ABCs. It's important. If you never learn anything beyond that, you're not very well equipped for, you know, an adult life. And so the idea is, you know, can you try something new, right? Can you maybe deepen your relationship with God? So, so it's not simply, the, the, there was a friend of mine, Mark Thibodeau, who wrote a book um, called Armchair Mystic. He has these four different ways of relating to God, which I really like talking at God, right? Talking with God, a little more kind of interactive, uh, listening to God and being with God, right? So the kind of prayers we're talking about mostly when we learn when we're little are kind of talking at God, asking for things, praising God, which is great, right? But again, if you use the relationship model, if that's the only thing you did, uh, it would say, you would say, what kind of relationship is that? If, if you and I went out to dinner, like in Society Hill in Philly, whenever the restaurants open up, and all I did was talk at you, you'd say, that's part of the conversation, right? Me saying things to you. But if that's all it was, you'd say, oh, we, we need to go a little deeper, right? We need to, we need to have something of a deeper relationship. So yeah, you, you start with those prayers and I think you can um, add to them as you get older. You know, you, um, in the book, you mention uh, at one point the, um, the Jesuit priest slash scientist, uh, Pe uh, Pierre Teilhard de Jardin, who, uh, you know, did a lot of spiritual writings, sort of looking at bridge Christianity and then sort of evolution, cosmology, paleontology, um, and, and, and sort of discuss this concept of, uh, you know, the different places we find God in, in repair via nature. Um, and it got me thinking a bit because, you know, I, I talk about different sort of nature related sort of concepts on the show. And, you know, one thing we think about, you know, nature as a, you know, this this area where we can find inspiration and solace and so forth. Uh, it doesn't speak English, right? It doesn't speak Italian or Chinese or anything like that. And, and nature speaks in forces mm -hmm. and fields and gravity, electromagnetism, all this stuff. Uh, you had a very interesting experience that you write about in the book. Uh, you're taking a bike ride, I believe, uh, I don't know if it was outside of Philly somewhere. Yeah, you had sort of a, Yeah. Talk a little bit about that experience, if you will, and sort of uh, finding sort of that 
connection to nature via uh, your own experience. Yeah. So I talked, there's a whole chapter in the book uh, on praying with nature or praying in nature. And um, this, this particular incident happened when I was a boy, I was growing up, um, as we said, outside of Philly in Plymouth meeting, I was going to Ridge Park elementary school uh, on my way to school. And I was biking across a meadow, basically, which is like a plot of land. It wasn't some big sort of fancy thing. And I really liked walking across it or biking across it when I was a boy. I probably was about maybe eight or nine years old. And it was a spring morning. Um, it was a beautiful morning. I can still remember it as we're talking. And uh, there were in this meadow were uh, snapdragons and uh, black eyed Susans and, and golden rods and Queen Anne's lace and all sorts of stuff, you know, so like weeds basically, but to me it was very beautiful. And I remember just stopping my bike and looking around and just having this kind of, well, let me just say memorable desire um, to just sort of like possess it, own it, be a part of it, understand it, uh, just this desire for more. And in the book, I call it a mystical experience, right? Not because I'm a saint or a big mystic, but to remind people that, you know, people have these experiences regularly. They're just not encouraged to talk about them. Well, by regularly, I mean, like, it's, it's regular in a person's life um, to, it's, it's, it's rare sometimes, but most people have these experiences. That's what I mean by regular. And, uh, and so, and that was, that was nature kind of, you know, as a, as a sort of way that God has of, of communicating with us. And I think if people look carefully in their lives, they'll discover incidents like that. They're just not a, a word I like to use. They're not encouraged to talk about them. People might say, oh, I, oh, that was really nice, right? And, or I was at the beach or I was down the shore or wherever, and I had this great moment of calm. Now, the next step is to say to the person, did you ever think that this might be God communicating with you through nature? And that's, that's one of the first steps in the spiritual life, to, to actually take that seriously, that invitation. And, and, you know, continuing along that, because later on in the book, I think in chapter 10, you talk about mystical experiences sort of defined as this experience of being filled with uh, a spiritual God's presence in a very intense way. Um, and, but, you know, typically you hear the word sort of mystical or mysticism it sounds kind of uh, occult in a, yeah. in a way. But at the same time, you know, you know, in Judaism, we have sort of Kabbalah, which sure. is this uh, mysticism, Jewish mysticism. Um, should mystic experiences being something that we aspire towards uh in prayer uh yeah that's what a what a great question and the answer is no because you know all these things are gifts basically and i think what we should aspire to in prayer um and i even even the shoulds are, are a problem for me uh you know I'm, I'm critiquing myself you know it's fidelity and it's like a relationship right so should you aspire in a relationship to every time you go out to dinner or do something that it's the highest and most enjoyable thing you've ever experienced and you should be laughing all the time? And No, because that's not realistic, right? And so with God, I think fidelity is key. And from time to time, you have these experiences. So definitely, especially with something like a peak experience, to sort of aim for that. It's, first of all, it's a gift, right? You can't, you can't produce it. You can't manufacture it. Um, and also one of the problems with um, prayer, especially people in the West, is that they tend to think of it as something that they do or something that, you know, that's supposed to be productive. And so if, uh, if I don't get a, a mystical experience or some sort of powerful experience, I've failed, you know, or I'm not a good prayer or God's mad at me or I've done something wrong, which is one of the reasons a lot of people don't pray. So, yeah, so no, we should definitely not aspire to it, but I think we should be open to it. I think that the other side is people say, oh, that's, that's not for me. I'm not a saint or I'm not some mystic, right? But so they're closed to it. So it's somewhere in between. And um, connecting again to the, the topic of, uh, of nature, finding God in nature, in, in one of the chapters uh, where you go in sort of um, things that sort of outcomes, let's say, sort of the, the physical outcomes of, of, of something from the the mystical to to the, the the world that I'm sitting in today, uh, you know, bring up um, some of the different uh, topics. We actually uh, the concept of uh, sort of Japanese forest bathing and mm. the fact, you know, there's these studies been done about how uh, in this particular context, a lower blood pressure, lower level of uh, stress hormones, and so forth. Uh, on through to you know something that um, you know we we touch a little bit on a previous show. Just uh, there's so many sort of let's say medical miracles out there that are totally unexplainable. <laughs> 
what are the things like spontaneous remissions and cancer and so forth. Uh, talk a little bit about sort of um, the, the physical things that we uh, potentially can uh, expect from prayer uh, throughout our lives. Yeah, um, I think there's the, I mean, as you were talking in terms of the sort of being with nature and the calming, I think that there's a natural, you know, physical response that happens when you calm down and pray, right? So it's, it's the same with people who meditate, but who might not be believers, right? So there's a physical response that happens when you just calm down and you breathe and, you know, your stress, stress goes down. But, you know, beyond that, um, we don't know what the the physical responses are going to be to prayer um, because it's, again, it's like a relationship because I think the danger is to say, for example, and I know most people wouldn't believe this, but some people would, you know, if I pray, I'll be healed from everything, right? Or if I pray, my illnesses are going to go away or I'll, well, this is the prosperity gospel. If I pray, then you know, God's going to reward me. I don't think that's the case at all. I mean, I think God, the relationship itself is the reward. And, you know, you can go through very difficult times and still feel God's presence. But physically, I think you can have a sense of, of calm and peace. The difference between, you, you were saying at the beginning, which I think is sound true, um, that there are so many different words for prayer and different people use them different ways. So what one person means by contemplation, the other person means by meditation, right? When I say meditation, I'm saying more the, 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 the sort of um, larger uh, definition of people who meditate who might not be believers, right? There's a lot of people who meditate uh, through yoga or just kind of mindfulness, you know, which is yeah. wonderful. Prayer, I think, is different. Prayer has an object, and the object is God. I mean, it's about a relationship. But within prayer, the kinds of benefits that you get from meditation, you'll get, right? The, the kind of calming uh, aspect of it, which I think is, you know, very, very helpful for people. Could you uh, talk for a few minutes? One of the one of the uh, chapters in the book is on Ignatian contemplation and the concept of praying through imagination. Mm. Can you take us on that just for a couple of minutes for those that may be very unfamiliar with that concept? Yeah, sure. So uh, it's called Ignatian because it's based on the life and teachings of Saint Ignatius, uh, the founder of the Jesuits. It's sometimes called Jesuit contemplation, and basically, it, Ignatius popularized this. He didn't invent it. Uh, it's, it's a way of using your imagination to enter usually into a, a scene from the Bible, right. Or a scene from scripture, but sometimes it can just be imagining yourself talking with Jesus and, or more God or whomever. And the idea is you use your imaginative senses. So you literally, as St. Ignatius says, it's a great term. You compose the place. So if you are, and you do this, the old Testament, new Testament, let's say the, the story of the Moses and the burning bush, Moses encountering God through the burning bush. You imagine what it would look, what would it look like? Okay. Now we don't know for sure, but you know, you can kind of imagine the scene and we've seen movies and stuff. What would it look like? What does Moses look like? Where is he? Is he in the desert? What does it sound like? I mean, is there a sort of crackling? Is it silent? What's, what's going on? Uh, what is, who are you in the story? Are you watching? Are you Moses? Are you, are you sort of a spectator? Uh, what do you what do you smell? I mean, it's in this story. Maybe you smell the burning bush. Maybe you don't. Um, what do you What are you tasting? You know, and in stories like uh, Jesus feeding the the crowds, you would taste the the loaves and the fish. So, what's the point? The point is, you imagine yourself in the story, and you accept the fact that your imagination is a gift. Now, that doesn't mean that everything you imagine in prayer is going to be some big message from God, but sometimes things are raised up. You know, so for example, if we're thinking about that story, right, sure. you might have an insight. So what can come up in prayer? Emotions, insights, desires, memories, images, words, phrases, feelings. So let's take, let's take that story, you know, because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a story that both of our traditions, you know, draw on. What are some insights that might come up during your prayer? You might think, wow, you know, I never thought how frightening that must have been, right? So Moses, Moses is approaching God and how unusual and, and odd that image is, you know, why would God choose that image, right? I mean, a, a bush that is not consumed by flame, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. And maybe you have an insight that, wow, it's interesting to me that Moses is able to encounter God and, you know, he takes off his shoes, you know, out of reverence, but he seems to be able to continue to talk to God, right? And continue to encounter God, even in the midst of this very strange, unusual experience. And so the insight might be, where am I called in my life to encounter God without fear, right? Even though it's overwhelming, or even though it's 
confusing, right? You might think about the pandemic, right? How am I called to encounter God without fear in the midst of something like that? The point is this. <clears throat> the point is, oftentimes when you use your imagination and you use Ignatian contemplation, things occur to you in prayer or happen in prayer that wouldn't happen when you were just reading it, right? Or hearing it preached or reading about it, right? It's, it's, it is God kind of using your imagination. It can be for a lot of people. It's not for everybody, right? I think it's mainly for people who, uh, you know, kind of like imaginative things like that. It can be extremely powerful because what happens is it makes it your own. It's not someone telling you what you should learn about Moses and the burning bush. It is an experience you have on your own that you trust is, is from God, you know, through your imagination, which is a gift. It's a very popular way of praying. Um, and most people that go on retreats with Jesuits and their colleagues, that's, that's the way they're invited to pray. It's not the only way, but that's, that's a, it's a very powerful form of prayer. Um, here we are in 2021. Uh, obviously, uh, it's a very unique technological era mm -hmm. uh, for, for everyone. Um, we... Last week had uh, Cardinal uh, Cherny on uh, talking about the, the crisis and, and health rosary. Obviously, it's difficult to get out in the middle of a pandemic and, and, and pray the way you might want to. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have that. We, we've uh, had the honor of talking to Archbishop uh, Pagli at the Pontifical Academy for Life about other Vatican initiatives related to sort of the intersection of humans and technology. Um, talk a little bit about technology and prayer, um, where it's useful, where you think it's not. Um, obviously, once again, very strange world in 2021 with social networks and so forth, but uh, take us a little on this if you would. Sure. Thoughts. Yeah. I mean, I would say it's a blessing a curse like you know pretty much everything in life two-edged sword i mean i'm i'm on social media a lot i have a facebook page twitter instagram and you know it's a way to connect with people right and one of the things i've been doing for the last year is on facebook um i've had a, what's called a faith sharing group we meet every uh friday at and talk about um the, the the sunday gospel reading this coming and that's turned into a book club you know for this learning to pray book and there's a community, right? And we, it, it's a real community. And we, people share their insights. And I, you know, I try to tell them what I know or what I think about the gospels. And so it does bring us together. And look, you know, as you know, I mean, we're, we're doing this via Zoom, right? I mean, without that technology, people would feel a lot more lonely uh, and people are able to connect, which is fantastic. And I think there are so many things um, that technology allows us to do. I mean, you know, I'm, you know sort of countless videos and podcasts that help people, right? And it, it's helpful. I mean, even something as simple as um, when I'm reading the gospel in the morning, I go on uh, something called Bible Hub and I look up the Greek, right? And I look at the interlinear translation. You know, that's a lot easier for me than it is to kind of, you know, have 8 million books, right, yeah. on my shelf. So that's, that's the blessing. It brings us together. It instructs us. It creates community, right? It can help us to pray, right? Now, of course, there is a downside. And the downside is, um, it can make us assume that, uh, you know, virtual communication is the same as one-on-one uh, -on -one communication, which it's not, right? It's, it's still a substitute. I also think the, the biggest uh, sort of drawback is that it's very distracting, mm -hmm. right? It, it just can be very distracting. And, um, you know, I find, for example, a very simple example, I have, um, there's a daily uh, reading resource called give us this day um, okay. and it's you know it's the booklet for the daily readings blah 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 i have it in print and i have it as an app on my phone i try always use to print because if i use the app on my phone oh you know bzz, there's another message and oh i'll check out that to see what that is and so you know you know better than anybody else we get distracted and we also get you know in a sense addicted to our devices when i was starting off giving retreats 20 years ago there were no cell phones, obviously. And when people came to a retreat house, the, I mean, this sounds like, you know, the dark ages, the only way that someone could contact them was by leaving a message at the retreat house reception area. And then the next day, the message would be put up on a little bulletin board on a, you know, <laughs> pink slip and they got the message. Now, everyone was fine. There were no emergencies. And, you know, even people who were, have, you know, young kids and stuff, you know, they were fine, right? Now, you go on a retreat and prying people's cell phones out of their hands is unbelievably difficult. And that makes it more difficult for them to pray, to just disconnect, right? Because at some point you have to be able to put down the phone, not because the phone's bad or technology's bad, but that one-on-one -on -one time with God, like in any relationship, yep. you got to put the phone down. 
And so I think there's a bit of addiction going on. I mean, I know there is. Um, so that's a so two-edged sword, two-edged sword. Absolutely. Um, any, any other uh, prayer-related messages for the audience? Obviously, a mix of, of all denominations uh, that you would like to get across at this point, if anything I missed uh, specifically that you like to focus on when you talk about the new book. Yeah, I mean, I think to remind people that prayer is for everyone. That's the first thing, because most people think that, uh, you know, I, I tried it, I've sat down, I've walked in the woods, whatever, and nothing happened, or it's boring, or I don't get what I prayed for. And in the book, I remind people that everybody goes through these uh, difficulties and these challenges, you know, my prayers dry from time to time. But that a lot of times it's people not being encouraged again to look at the things that are happening in their daily life and in their prayer, right, that they might overlook. And, and because it's sometimes it's very subtle and because, you know, God's trying to communicate with everyone. And I'd also say that the very desire for prayer is coming from God, right? That desire for prayer is really, is really coming from God. The other thing I'd say, a little Jesuit um, discernment, I think in the midst of the pandemic, people say, well, how do I know, you know, what's God saying? And my sense is that the, the shorthand Jesuit spirituality for the pandemic is that God is working through the voices of hope in your life. And the voices of despair and hopelessness, they're simply not coming from God. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, go back to the Old Testament of the Hebrew Scriptures, you know, choose, you know, you know, God says, I set before you, you know, blessing and curse, life and death. You know, there these, it's discernment, right? And it's a choice. You know, Moses and the Hebrew people have a choice. Okay, what, what are you going to choose? You're going to choose this, you're going to choose life, but you're going to choose this. And in our contemporary situation, it's God saying, Look, I'm offering you hope and and a, and a feeling of um, uh, you know, possibility, right, and uplift or despair, and it's clear which is coming from God. And so, in terms of discerning the voices, that's really important, especially in the pandemic. So, basically, shorthand is hope is coming from God, despair is not. That's my pandemic spirituality. Wonderful. Uh one, one, one final question. Uh, any any new, obviously, <laughs> Broadway's closed down and uh, uh, things are all in upheaval, but any new interesting initiatives on the theater and film front uh, that you would talk about? Or any, any other initiatives in general, uh, conferences, uh, talks you're going to be giving, anything else that you want to talk about? Uh, yeah, I think I can say this. Um, sure. I'm not, it's not really been announced yet. And there's not a whole lot around it, but what the heck, since you asked such a specific question. Cool, I get a scoop. All right. Got <laughs> kind of. Um, so there's a documentary coming out soon uh, about my LGBT ministry. Okay. Called Building a Bridge. Um, so they, this documentary team had been following me around for about two years, like all over the place, all over the world, actually. It looks like, it's almost like, you know, where, where in the world is Jim Martin? Um <laughs> And it's uh, it's it's coming out in a couple months. That's all I can probably say. It'll you'll be you'll be seeing it maybe it. It's been submitted to film festivals and stuff like that. So yeah, so that's kind of exciting. But the big thing I'm working on right now, obviously, is this book. This yeah. book, learning to pray. So, but no, yeah. So that's no one's asked me that directly. So what the heck? There you go. There's a little scoop. Yeah. So keep your eyes peeled. Outstanding. Uh, Father Martin, it, it, was, it was great talking to you. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to, to come talk to us for a little while today. Um, for everybody that's going to be listening to this episode on the podcast or watching on the YouTube channel, uh, you've been listening to Father James Martin, priest, writer, editor-at-large at the America Magazine. Uh, pick up his new book, Learning to Pray, A Guide for Everyone. Uh, check out all his books on Amazon for that matter. Uh, Father Martin, it's, once again, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. And as we like to say on this, thank you for helping uh, to create a better tomorrow through everything you're involved in. It was a real honor. My, to talk to you. my pleasure. And, uh, you know, go Quakers, right? <laughs> Great seeing you.